Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Cheng Wang, who's going to talk today about how to improve the efficiency in inferencing chips. So Cheng, when people talk about the edge, it's a ver pretty vague concept at this point, the, the demarcation line between the very end device all the way up to the data center seems to be very fluid these days. What are we actually looking at when you think about edge? Yeah, edge in our concept is basically anything that is outside of a data center. It can be a rack of server in the back of a retail store to something as small as a individual camera processing, you know, doorbell frames or security camera footages and so on. So it can uh, really have a wide uh, spread of market uh, applications that we're talking about. And one of the interesting things about the edge is nobody owns a space at this point, right? This is brand new. Exactly. And uh, that's why I think it's a very fertile ground for a lot of companies to, to try to take the lead on this space. Um, there is a lot of very good hardware uh, developed for data centers, um, and they are high-performance chips, you know, from NVIDIA, Habanas, and so on. But um, a lot of the requirements for edge inferencing, such as, you know, low batch sizes, like batch of one, as opposed to, say, batch of 100 for data center applications, those kind of things um, have placed a requirement on some very different hardwares, and um, also the power and cost uh, trade-offs um, that's involved in edge computing has also uh, called for a need for some much more efficient, much more dedicated uh, edge AI devices. So let's drill into how we improve that efficiency, drop the cost. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, of course. So as you know, a, a lot of the big guys have a CPU or GPU-based solution, and that's fine, especially if you, um, you know, are using this for training, or in some cases, even for inferencing, if you're in a data center or something that has a large batch size, it's because you have a million users running a thousand image sun, uh, running a thousand image searches at any given point in time. Those things um, are well suited for you know CPUs and GPUs where the overhead for loading the weights and preparing the the, the Mac unit with data um, can be amortized over many frames. But in edge computing, it's oftentimes much more difficult to amortize the bandwidth for the different layers. So what have you drawn here? This looks like a subset of a neural network. Yes, yes. This is trying to make a point of how efficient hardware, especially in our case, efficient reprogrammable hardware, can better serve the need for low batch sizes and low DRAM and SRAM bandwidth. So we can take just a very simple neural network model of just two convolution layers. Say the, the input is a two megapixel picture. That's, you know, 2000 by 1000 by, you know, RGB or YUV or whatever. So it's roughly six megabytes if you store them as 8-bit integers. And then that goes through the first layer um, of processing, and then it goes through the second layer of processing, and then it gets stored. This is a very simplistic example for me to make a point. One of the concepts that, that's floating around here is layer grouping. What is that? Yes, so um, for a processor or for most hardware, for example, they will completely finish processing the first convolution layer, store the output somewhere before processing the second convolution layer. That's usually because they have some kind of matrix multiplication engine that they will first have to be programmed for the, the filters, which is the the convolution weights for the first layer, push the input through it, and store the output to some kind of a memory. And then um, set the weights to be the filter for the second layer, and then read the output from the previous layer out of memory, and do the processing one more time to get to your final output, which is then, of course, written back to memory again. So what do you do to bring all this together? Yes, so in order to try to make this more efficient, we, we actually took a step back and go, hmm, for some of the models, you know, say a YOLO V3, the, after the very first layer, the activation size can blow up. A two megapixel image that used to be six megabytes is, is now 64 megabytes. And 64 megabytes of activation is very difficult to store in SRAM unless you have a large chip, but most inferencing chips are not large, so they are stored in DRAM. And most inferencing chips do not have that many DRAMs, therefore it results in a significant um, pipeline stall from the compute 
because they have to wait for the DRAM to finish outputting the data because there's 64 megabyte of, of data to output here. And when the output has been completed, the next layer they have to read it all back from DRAM. So there is a significant amount of DRAM bandwidth wasted, also a significant amount of Mac efficiency lost in this process. This follows some of the efficiency rules for almost all AI chips, right? Which it means that you have to keep data moving through very fast and you also have to keep every every part of this active. Exactly. You know, a lot of AI chips have a huge amount of Mac arrays. Everybody talk about peak tops, peak, you know, throughput and so on. But in many, many cases, uh, in fact, almost all cases, you're limited by something else. And oftentimes that is a memory bandwidth. So we can have a very efficient Mac array, but if it requires a, through, a full throughput, a memory bandwidth of 256 gigabytes per second to absorb the throughput, and you, and you only have, I don't know, 12 gigabytes per second, that's going to be a 5% Mac utilization because 95% of the time it's waiting for the DRAM to finish writing and the same happens for the next layer, 95% of the time, it's waiting for the DRAM to read in. How much of a gain can you get in terms of performance improvement and also reduction in power by doing it this way? Exactly. So um, in cases I just talked about where 95% of the time we're waiting for the DRAM transfers, 95% of the time the power is being burned by the DRAM. In fact, the, the, the DRAM power will almost certainly far outweigh the Mac power for these cases. But if we can do it slightly differently. In other words, we can use our embedded FPGA technology to route the convolution outputs directly through the filter and, and basically process the output of the previous layer on the fly um, and process the output of the next layer straight as the final output of the neural network. We can do this because we have reconfigurable hardware. We can purpose portions of the max to do layer zero, portions of the max to do layer one, and dedicate some certain amount of interconnect fabric to do the routing so that the, the data from one layer to the next can flow through. Now suddenly, we don't have to write any of these intermediate activations to the DRAM or the SRAM, and we can get much higher Mac utilization. So say uh, previously 75% uh, of the power is dominated by the DRAM, 95% of the compute time is dominated by the DRAM, we just got rid of all of that. Uh, so we get you know easily a few times higher power efficiency and orders of magnitude higher throughput by, em by eliminating a lot of these DRAM accesses by allowing the data to flow through from one, one layer to the next in one group. This is what we call as layer grouping. We're processing this as essentially a giant layer while the, uh, the output of one layer is activated um, and routed to the next layer as it, as it is coming out of the previous layer. Can these be parallelized as well? Can you use more than one chip together? Absolutely. This can be parallelized in many, many ways. We can choose to, say, slice an image across multiple parallel engines, but generally that's done on one chip. A chip can have multiple Mac arrays. Ours do, many people's do, and they can each be used to process a different portion of the model, or say, uh, excuse me, a different portion of the image, or we can say, have a big model sliced across multiple chips where each chip processes a different portion of the model. This is probably a better topic for another day though. Also, just along those lines, can you also put in something like HBN memory to improve the throughput versus what you have here? Exactly. So um, it, it will certainly help. Um, it depends on how much of a throughput are you dominated um, by the DRAM versus the Mac. In this case, what we're trying to do is in many ways avoid these more expensive memory solutions in edge uh, devices to bring down the cost to improve the efficiency, which is performance per dollar. Therefore, we just use these architectural techniques um, to avoid DRAM access as much as possible, as opposed to a more brute force approach, which is to increase the bandwidth to the memory by using, say, HBMs or more DRAM chips in parallel. And does this work uh, for an edge device like a s smart sensor with uh, some compute power in there as well as uh, going into a, uh, a group server? Exactly. Um, yes. Uh, 
Uh, this architecture is very scalable, just like our embedded FPGA architecture. We can have a small as one uh, uh, one max that is sliced for say 50% here and 50% here, or we can have a group of say a four by four array or six by six array of max where each of the MAC groups can be doing a particular layer or a combination of a particular layer. So it does scale up extremely well. Does the use model affect this? So for example, on a AI type of chip, you expect it to behave differently depending upon how you're using it. Mm, I think the model, the, the different type of applications that leads to different models can have an effect on whether or not this will be efficient or not. This will be more efficient on models that require substantial amount of inter intermediate activations, which will generally be some fairly high-end image recognition, object detection, object recognition uh, algorithms, as opposed to you know, uh, some of the lower-end algorithms like speech or audio and so on. So this is more for a higher end of video image processing related issues. So this could be something like a, an image recognition in a, in a car. It all, could also be a security system with high resolution. Exactly. Chen Wang, thanks for a great explanation. Uh, thank you, Ed.